Good morning. Have your Bibles open to the book of Psalms, please. We're going to be studying from Psalm 8 this morning, but I'd like to read a few things from several of the surrounding Psalms first. The Psalms often ask life's most poignant questions for us. They provide answers as well, but notice some of the questions that the Psalms ask. Psalm 13 and verse 1. How long, O Lord, wilt thou forget me forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? That's a question that many of us ask when we do not understand the timetable of God. Notice chapter 10 and verse 1. Psalm 10 and verse 1. Why dost thou stand afar off, O Lord? Why dost thou hide thyself in times of trouble? Why does it seem like God isn't there when we need Him most? Psalm 2 and verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? Why is it the people of the world set themselves so heartily against God and His cause and His people? Go to Psalm 52 and verse 1. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? Why does man love evil as much as he does? Not only why does he love it, why does he boast in it? Why is evil a point of pride for people? Psalm 119 and verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. These are the great questions of life, aren't they? They're the questions that vex us. The unbeliever probably more than the believer, yes, but they are the great, the great questions that we're all asking. And the same is true of Psalm 8, where the writer asks, what is man? What is man? Such a simple question, isn't it? but one that bothers us, one that confuses us. Maybe it's a question that we all think we know the answer to. But what is man? And especially in the context of Psalm 8, what is man that of all the creatures, that of all the things in this universe, that God would look upon us and give us so much glory? To place us in the order of creation where we are, in spite of our sin, and our frailty, and our failure. One writer summed up, Psalm, uh, summed up Psalm 8 verse 1 in this way. This psalm is altogether a psalm of praise and thanksgiving. Its primary idea is the condescending love and good of God towards man. That God who made the heavens and set His glory on them should have regard for man and visit him. And not only so, but give him so lofty a position, so exalted a destiny, is a thought that is well nigh overwhelming. So let's begin in verse 1 as we read Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Thy name in all the earth! who hast displayed thy splendor above the heavens. A couple of points there as we get started. I like that he displays his splendor, that it is there for all people to see. The idea of display means that it is public. The idea of display means that God has nothing to hide of what he wants us to know. You have displayed your splendor, but where? You've displayed your splendor above the heavens. Now, of course, we understand that this is a three-dimensional universe and that space is not like some dome that sits over us. That space continues and continues, hypothetically, I suppose, for infinity. And yet God's glory is beyond that, above that. When I think of God's glory, I think of the idea of seeing beyond just what we can see. You know the old adage about missing the forest for the trees where you focus so much on the thing that's right in front of you, the detail that you can see that's right there, that you forget to see the big thing that's beyond that? I think the same thing happens with this creation. 
We see the stars and we see the moon and we see the sun. We see everything on planet Earth. With a microscope, we can see all the way down to the smallest thing on planet Earth. And yet you have to see past that to see God's glory. His glory is displayed above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, thou hast established strength because of thine adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Now, there's a couple of different theories about verse 2 as to how it's to be interpreted. Some take it very literally that from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, God can establish strength. That even with the smallest and weakest thing, God can establish His strength. That God could overthrow kingdoms with the strength of a baby. I, that's no problem at all with that interpretation. Other people see it as more of an accommodative thing. That instead of literally being infants and nursing babes, what he's talking about is small children who have the most basic verbiage at their capacity. What he would mean by that, then, if that's how you interpret it, is that from the mouth of even our youngest ones, as they make any kind of proclamation of faith, and I've seen it in my own kids, you've seen it in your kids, there is a trust and a faith that kids have in their parents as well as in God that we lose somewhere along the way when we become adults. And when Sterling and when Heidi and when Bennett, when they say something about God, when they make some proclamation of faith, even in their young age, that is a foundation upon which their faith can rest as they get older. They can build upon that foundation that what we learn as young people is something that we can continue to grow in as we grow up. But I think it doesn't even have to be that complicated. Look at what's being used here. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, strength has been established. Why? What's the purpose? Why has God established strength through such weak characters? To make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Now, could God have overwhelmed the enemy and the revengeful? Could he have overpowered them? Could he have destroyed them with a single word, with a single stroke? Of course he could. And on the last day, God will destroy this earth and all of its works. And every person who lived in rebellion from the beginning until the end will be judged by God. And yet look at what he chooses to do. To disarm enemies and the revengeful with the weak with the innocent, with the humble. Maybe the practical application is this, that you can overpower your enemies, you can overwhelm your enemies, you can fight against your enemies, you can respond in kind when they treat you miserably, or you can be innocent and humble and sweet. And with the strength of a nursing baby, you can disarm your enemies. I believe the New Testament supports this idea as well. Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount about how you're supposed to respond to your enemies. And it's not in kind, but with kindness. But let's move on to verse 3 now. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, I like that he considers them. How often have you stopped and considered the heavens, the work of God's fingers? I don't want to sound too stop and smell the roses here. But don't we spend a little bit too much of our lives focusing on our own creations, worried about the things that we've crafted with our own hands and our own minds, that sometimes we forget to stop and consider God's works? The thing is that when you surround yourself with your own creations, your house is your own creation. Your job is your own creation. You're building something, making something, writing something leaving some legacy behind. Your family, in a sense, is your own creation. Now I understand that all of these things stem from God as their originator. That if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't even have the material to build a house. We wouldn't even have the ability to have children. I understand that. But in a sense, within this life's context, those are our creations. Those are the things that we create. We craft them. We make them. And if we're surrounded all the time by the work of our own hands, a house, a job, family, 
doesn't that distract us from looking at God? I can spend my whole life patting myself on the back because I've done a good job making a life for myself that I might entirely forget who it was that made that life possible. Looking up at the stars, admiring the moon, letting a little of that warm sunlight in January on our face, that's a reminder that all of this is God's handiwork. He is behind it all. He is behind me. He is behind you. He makes life possible. In the busyness of life, don't forget to consider God's works. But when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, this is the question that he is led to. When he looks at the stars and the moon, when he looks at the heavens, this is what the writer wants to ask in response to that majesty. What is man? And what is man that thou dost take thought of him? Why do you care about us so much? Why expend so much energy on something so small? What is the son of man, he says, that thou dost care for him? And yet, in verse 5, thou hast made him for a little while lower than God, and dost crown him with glory and majesty. Thou dost make him to rule over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. What are we? <laughs> that God should care about us so much that He should show such concern for what appears to be a rather meager part of His creation. If God can speak the sun into existence, and if you take the stars at their word, if God can speak millions and billions of suns into existence with just, just a word, just a word, what are we really? Inconsequential. Inconsequential. In comparison to the heavens, that is. This is the central question of this psalm. This is the central question, I believe, of life. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, it doesn't matter. Whether God is in your life or you have excluded God from your life, it doesn't matter. The atheist and the Christian alike are asking the same question. What is man? What's the point behind all of it? Why are we here? The only difference between the believer and the unbeliever, the Christian and the atheist, is that we actually have an answer. We actually have an answer. And we have an answer that isn't just a philosophical dead end. What is man? There is something different about man, isn't there? This is an unimaginably immense and complicated universe. And for all of our studying and all of our diagramming, our dissecting and our theorizing about the universe and its scope and its origins and what could possibly be out there and is there a little tiny Martian worm crawling around in that red sand somewhere? For all of the questions that we might have and for all the answers we believe that we've come to, we will never fully understand the breadth of this creation. There will always be things out there that are beyond our grasp and beyond our reach. And yet, there's something different about mankind. And for some strange reason, God took small, limited, temporal, physical man and said, all of this is for you. And I put you in charge of it as well. There's a little bit of irony, isn't there? That we have been granted dominion over a creation that we cannot ourselves fully understand. I mean, it would almost be like if you were just handed the keys to a gigantic castle. And they said, it's yours. It's yours. You have dominion over it. You're in charge of this place. 
But there are rooms in this castle that you'll probably never discover. Secret passageways. Don't go in the attic, by the way. There's something weird up there. This is a creation that we, we, we'll spend millennia. We have spent millennia analyzing it and diagramming it and exploring it. And there's always going to be something else out there to explore. There's always going to be something else out there for us to learn. Something else that we can use to our advantage. That impresses me. That impresses me. And I believe that is because God made us to be different. God made us to stand out in this universe. That for all of the stars and the moons that He could create, for all of the swirling spheres of gas that He could put out there in the universe, for all the galaxies that He could make just with a word, there is something about man that is supposed to be different. He looked at everything else when creating this universe. He said, this is good. He created man and He said, this is very good. Everything else was created with His words, but we are the only thing that was created with His breath in us. We're different. Made in the image of God. Meant to be like God. Meant to reside with God at the end of all things. And God has set us upon planet Earth as masters of a world that we will never fully comprehend. And like the writer of Psalm 8 seems to be saying, this is a very humbling idea. Let's talk about the seas for a few moments here. Because he says in verse 8, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. There's a lesson there that I think could be really easy to skip on past. A little nugget there that I think is worth pointing out. It's easy for us to forget that mankind has not always known so much about the sea and its mysterious creatures. Now we, we don't know everything about the sea still to this day. In spite of the technology that we have that we use to our service in exploring the sea, there's still things in the sea that we don't know about. I have no doubt at all that there are creatures at the bottom of the ocean that we have yet to discover. And it is likely that when we get to the end of this world on the Judgment Day, there will probably still be creatures at the bottom of the sea that we haven't yet discovered. Which is interesting because it means that God created things that no human is ever going to see. You ever think about that? Even if we do discover some little critter at the bottom of the ocean, you do realize that that critter was left undiscovered for thousands of years. That as God was creating things in Genesis 1, He created creatures, He created animals that we're never going to see. He created stars that until we discovered the ability to use a telescope that we couldn't see with the naked eye. There's things about this creation both on planet Earth and far, far beyond that have just sat there undiscovered, unseen by human eyes perhaps until the end of time. And I wonder why. Why go to all the trouble? Why expend creative energy on elements that would forever remain shrouded in mystery, at least it's mysteries to us. And I think the answer is that He is the Creator. That it is in His nature, it is His character, creating is what He does. And when He creates something, it is part of a system that is bigger than we can comprehend. Mankind pats itself on the back because we have made diagrams of everything. And we think we're so smart because we've given species and family designations to every creature living on planet Earth. Where the platypus is supposed to go, I still don't understand. But we think we're so smart because we've categorized everything. And we think that we're the first ones who ever did it. And yet God's probably sitting on His throne going, you guys don't even know the half of it. You, you haven't even discovered that critter over there. You don't even know about that thing. Even with the Hubble telescope, you, you haven't even seen yet that galaxy over there. 
He probably looks at all of our theories about black holes and we think we know what black holes are and he's going, you guys don't even get it, do you? There's things about this universe that we're not ever going to discover, but it is because God is the creator and creating is what he does. And if God wanted to create a million galaxies or a billion galaxies, with a word he can do it. And if God wanted to create animals on planet Earth that we're never going to see, in spite of the fact that we have dominion over them, that is simply in God's character. Now, I say all of this because I believe it is illustrating the point of Psalm 8. The writer of Psalm 8 never saw the bottom of the ocean. Let's be clear about that. I don't know exactly who it was. The subtitle says a Psalm of David. I don't know if David actually wrote this or if that was an editor's decision at some point. But even if it was David, did David ever have a submersible? Did David have a submarine? No. And yet here is David, a man who never went to the bottom of the ocean, living at a time when nobody ever went to the bottom of the ocean. And he says, whatever passes through the paths of the sea, even that is under mankind's dominion. And that should blow our minds. It should blow our minds that man has been so elevated to such a lofty position that even things we will never touch and things we will never see, even that is below us because we have been made a little bit lower than God. We have been made a little bit lower than God. And you can't say the same thing about a dog or a horse or a black hole or a galaxy. But that's not all this psalm has to say to us. There is a messianic element to this psalm that I'm sure you noticed as we were reading through it. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. And notice Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. One has testified somewhere, quoting from Psalm 8, saying, What is man that thou rememberest him, or the son of man that thou art concerned about him? Thou hast made him for a little while lower than the angels. By the way, the word angels there and the word God back in Psalm 8, it's a generic use of the word Elohim, spiritual being. Not literally talking about God himself, but talking about spiritual beings, such as angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, and hast appointed him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. But he has this to say in verse 8. In subjecting all things to him, that is man, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Now the thing that bothers the writer of Hebrews is this. If you read Psalm 8, it says that all things have been subjected to us, but are there things that are not yet subjected to us? What's the really big one? What is the one thing about life on planet Earth that all of us have to face at some point that has not been subjected to us? Death. Death. Death is a part of life, isn't it? It's a part of the process that we undergo. And that vexes the writer of Hebrews. I'm told in Psalm 8 that all things are subjected to us, that we're made just a little bit lower than God. And yet, when I look at life and I look at death, I don't see that all things have been subjected to us. But we do see him in verse 9, who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely, Jesus. Because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And we could keep reading, of course. But I think what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, Psalm 8 has a limited application to mankind. But it finds its ultimate application in the Messiah. Because it is only the Messiah who truly has had all things, including physical death, subjected to him. And if it wasn't for the Messiah, Psalm 8 
would never come true. But it is in the Messiah, it is in Jesus Himself that Psalm 8 finds its truest, fullest expression. And it is because of Jesus, the man, Jesus, who is God in the flesh, that we can be a little bit lower than God and have even death subjected to us. And Jesus could have appeared as anything. You ever think about that? Did Jesus have to come and be a lowly, humble human being? Could Jesus have come as a giant statue of gold? Could He have come as some kind of a ravenous beast? Could He have come as a blue whale, the biggest thing on planet Earth? Could He have come as a star? Could He have come as just a beam of light? I suppose if that had been God's will for Him to come in that form, but He came as a human. Daniel chapter 7 predicts the coming of the Messiah, describing Him as one like a son of man. He came as a human. Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 6 describes the humility of Jesus. That even though He is equal with God, He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. That is, held on to, kept for His own purposes. But He emptied Himself. He humbled Himself. And He came in appearance as a man to serve all of us. And where is Jesus now? Where is our Messiah at this very moment? He's reigning at the right hand of God, glorified, ready to receive us into the eternal kingdom. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you really ought to be. Perhaps Psalm 8 or some other scripture has piqued your curiosity and you'd like to study more. If so, let this congregation know and we'll open up our Bibles together and present to you the Word of God. Simply put, the Gospel is Mark 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So whatever need you might have, please come forward as we stand and sing.